How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hanging in there. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm ready. I guess things may never get back to normal. I just need to accept that fact. <laughs> yeah, they may not, the, there'll be a new way of doing everything, but. I know. Oh, well, how did your bread turn out? I've, I've made that bread and it's really good, I thought. Oh my gosh, it's so, it's too good. Yeah. I tried to get another box of that after I made it once and they didn't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, my friend, uh, because I gave a uh, slice to her this morning, my dog sitter, <laughs> dropped my dogs off there again. <laughs> and I gave her a slice and she texted me. She's like, oh my gosh, I need this. And she found it on Amazon. But on Amazon, it was like nineteen dollars. Oh, I don't gosh. know. Yeah, it's so not it's that like, good. <laughs> I know. I was like, you can get a beer bread recipe on like the internet. <laughs> hey, stop! You hear my dog? As I try to catch her, and she runs away. <laughs> Wants attention. Well, this class has generated some excitement. It's um, got twenty over 20 people signed up i don't know if they'll all come but wow that's yeah. a lot yeah that's awesome i'm supposed to come up with like virtual l3x classes so i've been trying to think you know the, our l3x is that month-long thing we have in september because we're thinking with our demographic age group we're still not going to be able to really do a lot yeah so i was trying to think of would you guys, maybe you and Tristan could do this, like, like have a class, like kind of like ask an archaeologist or something yeah, like that? Yeah, we would love to do that. Sure. Yeah, maybe talk about what it's like to be one a little bit and then like have people ask questions and, you know, like what, what do you do? And, you know, what, you know, I don't know. I, I just what it's like. Oh, you yeah, know, we have the, good stories. Between the two of us, we have some pretty good stories. Tristan was chased down by an emu once doing field work. So. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you see, that sounds awesome. If you could just do, you know, something a little, like, talk about some stories, and then, you know, you wouldn't even have to make a PowerPoint. Just talk, about, unless you wanted to, you know, talk about stuff you did, and then um, have people ask questions. I think that would be exciting. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah, we love talking about all our weird stories, so... <laughs> Okay, well, people would love that. So it'll be sometime in September, and I'll send you like options for times, and y'all can do it. Yeah, so yeah, oh, I'm excited. Fun. Yay, okay. Yeah. yeah if you any other ideas of any exciting thing I can do online or hear of anything, just let me know. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, we're we're it's this is like a whole new world trying to do yeah. like public outreach and stuff with digital because I. Um, one of my coworkers was telling me that even though, you know, things are starting to open up that there, I think CNN, it was, did a survey about how comfortable people are with going out into the world. And the numbers were extremely low, like below 20% were yeah. ready and felt, felt perfectly comfortable getting out and about. Well, and I think our age group is probably even lower because, you know, I the age group so. like 60s and up are, you know, ones that you know, we, we're, you know, my kids won't, they, they, they're always asking me, have you gone? Cause I'm, I'm turning 65 this summer. So my kids are, I, did you go, did, you know, I shouldn't, I'm not even supposed to go to the grocery store in a mask, you know, according to them. Well, we'll go for you, you know, <laughs> well, I need something today. I need to, you know, but yeah. yeah. I've been the same way about my parents. I'm like, I've been, they, uh, they live out in the middle of nowhere. So there's not, there's not like Instacart and stuff like that, but I have a friend that lives close to them and she and I have been like coordinating and uh, because my parents, there, my dad, he's not even like wearing a mask or anything. And I'm like, dad, oh. please. Yeah. Yeah. We do that. We take all the precautions, you know, and I just said to them, remember when you were a teenager and you used to, I used to worry all the time because I know you did stuff that you didn't tell me and that I knew wasn't. And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, now well, you know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. true. Yeah, no, this is, it's very strange. Like this, I go for a walk when I wake up in the morning. And usually I don't run into anybody. But today there was another guy on the sidewalk. 
and it was very anxiety inducing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to, as soon as you see, you always have to be on the alert if you yeah. see somebody on a walk over and yeah. It's... I know, I was like, ah, so I like stepped over into somebody's yard and let him pass. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have my mask with me because I usually don't run into anybody. So I guess I should probably at least start bringing my mask with me. And that way, if so, I see somebody, I can throw it on. But I don't usually walk in a mask. I just walk, oh, try to stay, you know, get it's more than six feet from somebody. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just walked into somebody's yard and let him walk past me. Yeah. And I probably looked ridiculous. But <laughs> and I hate it because I feel like there's people out there that probably think you're overreacting and I feel like they're judging you or like, and he just, he happened to be Asian too. So I was like, ah, I don't want him to think like, I think he has the yeah. virus because well, I don't think <laughs> most people do anymore. And if, if they're judging you because you're wearing a mask that they're being really stupid because you're yeah. protecting them. So but like, I was just like, oh my gosh, he's Asian. Am I making him feel uncomfortable because I'm making him think that he has yeah. a virus because of his ethnicity? Ah! Yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, no, all kinds of things. Oh gosh. Yeah, but I just hope things yeah. get better. At least I'm worried about this whole opening up because there's going to be. Yeah, I think they can't not get more cases that way. Yeah. So. I am going to start admitting people All right. and I'll do like my little introduction. I'm going to talk up another class that we have coming up in next week in this time slot. And um, then I'll turn it over to you and then you're in charge. You do anything, you know, and you're ending it. I'll still watch and everything, but I'm, I'm you know, and I'll leave myself muted. I mean, <laughs> unmute it in case I have to say anything, but I, you know, or I might, I might mute myself, but I'll unmute if I need to, but I don't think I will. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so let's see. Start meeting people. <laughs> Hello. Hello. We're still admitting people, so. Hi. Hi, Barbara. Good. How are you doing? Good. Hey. Hey, Maureen. Hi. Hi. Hey. I'm still admitting people, so that's why we're not okay. saying anything. Okay. Still letting people in. <laughs> I did one of these at the Gaston Art Center. It was fun. Okay, I'm gonna give it. We still have a few people that said they were coming, so I'll give it another minute or so, then we'll get started. That they can hear you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What we what we ask you to do is everybody mute themselves unless you have a question. When you have a question, unmute yourself and then mute yourself again because we have all kinds of noise that comes from everybody's house. For example, my dog was just barking, and you know everybody we don't want to hear that all of it. So um, just so if you can mute yourself and then one and then if you have a question, unmute yourself and then mute yourself again. That's been working okay. well in our online classes.
Um, so I guess I'll get started and I'll just keep admitting people as they come in. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Maureen Haberfeld from the uh, Tallahassee Senior Center Lifelong Learning Coordinator. And we are very uh, happy to have Barbara Clark again this week, two weeks in a row from uh, the Florida Public Archaeology Network. And she's going to be talking about historic cemeteries and um, as cultural resource. And uh, I'd just like to, somebody else coming in, to uh, mention a few things. First of all, um, keep yourself muted, like I, I just said, but I don't know if everybody heard me. Keep yourself muted unless you have a question, then unmute yourself. That way we don't get the noise from everybody's house and it makes it hard to hear. Um, the other thing I'd like to, oh, there's another person. Um, mention is uh, we have a new class if you have not looked at your constant contact from the senior center it comes from sheila look at it today we have some new fitness classes and we also have a new lifelong learning class that we just advertised that starts next tuesday in this time slot and it's called china now and it's by tom friedman he's a very popular instructor that has taught a number of classes for us and uh, Tom is a retired FBI agent. He's um, lived and traveled all over the world. He worked with China when he was an FBI agent and the Chinese, and he knows a lot about them. We're hearing about China every day in the news. Uh, so, you know, it'll be a really interesting class. I think it'll be four weeks. It starts next Tuesday, May the 12th. And it'll be the, that Tuesday and then the three Tuesdays following that from 1.30 to 3. So if you want to register, we are going to start online registration for, for the lifelong learning classes, though it won't start until the June classes. So if you are interested in registering for Tom's class or the national parks or anything else that I'm offering for lifelong learning, just email me. And then for the classes that start in June, it'll be uh, changing to online registration. And you can email me if you have any questions about that. And uh, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Barbara now. She's going to become the host. I'm going to make her the host. And uh, then she'll be in charge. And I'll just be listening after that. So unless anybody has any questions for me before I go off. Questions? OK. Well, thanks for coming. It's going to be fun. OK. All right. I'm making you the host, Barbara. All right, alrighty. Let me share my screen here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> my delivery is being dropped off as we speak. So, um, thank you all. Can you all see the screen? You all see my slides? Perfect. So as Maureen said, my name is Barbara Clark. I am Regional Director for the Florida Public Archaeology Network here in Tallahassee. Um, today we're going to be talking about historic cemeteries, which is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, it's funny because as a little girl, my mom is from England and she used to drag me around to see all these old historic homes and all these old cemeteries. And it, I didn't like it. Apparently, I told her one day and I said, Mom, how many more dead people in their homes do we have to see? And so every time I give this presentation, I have to like, you know, acknowledge her because I think my love of cemeteries comes from her. Um, so a lot of people don't think of archaeological sites or cemeteries as archaeological sites, um, but they are. Uh, they're subterranean, they're below ground. And they are made and used by people, which by definition makes them archaeological as well. Um, archaeology is one branch of anthropology, so some people will use them interchangeably. Archaeology is the branch where we dig in the dirt and we find the things that artifacts from people that lived a long time ago, and we kind of use those to put together a puzzle of our past, as I like to say. We actually use a lot of the same techniques that crime scene investigation does, uh, especially when it comes to cemeteries, um, because you're dealing with human remains. So burials are very, very important, and people have been burying our, you know, their loved ones for a long time. Here in Florida, we have burials that date to around 8,000 years ago. This is important because it shows uh, something that's kind of unique to people 
uh, to humans. We uh, revere and bury our dead. A lot of times it's because we love them, because we care for them, but also it has a religious component, which makes us unique to any other primate or animal. Um, and cemeteries are very fascinating because they show cultural practices. You can also learn pathologies, epidemiology. And in fact, there's a cemetery in um, St. Joe, uh, the old St. Joseph Cemetery that I've been talking about a lot lately just because it's a pandemic cemetery. Um, yellow fever pandemic hit and they actually le left St. Joe and you can see a photo of it there on the lower part of the screen. But people left St. Joe because of the yellow fever and uh, at that time it was called St. Joseph and now it's Port St. Joe. It's the same community, just kind of two separate population uh, scenarios. Uh, here in Florida, we're really lucky because we have such a diverse cultural landscape. We have Southeast Indian, African American, Bahamian, Cuban, Greek, and all these different cultures bring with them different burial practices. And what's really significant about burial practices is they tend to be the least changed aspect of culture. At least they don't change. It takes them longer to change over time. Um, and so that can really help us as archaeologists and anthropologists understand what is really, really significant at the core to a specific culture. Now, cemeteries, I like to think of them as outdoor museums. Um, you can learn so much. One of the things I do when I go on road trips is I always stop at the local cemetery because it gives you an idea of that, a feel for that community. Um, you can learn about socioeconomic backgrounds of the people that live there, the ethnicity, how diverse a community is, how, you know, the different types of religions that are there. Um, sometimes, especially if you go to Old City, Old City Cemetery in Tallahassee here, you start walking around and you'll see a lot of names that are also on buildings or roads here in town. And so that kind of shows you who the significant families were, historically speaking. Settlement patterns, epidemiology, um, as we were talking about, like the St. Joseph Cemetery, and also folk art. Um, this is especially true for lower socioeconomic classes. You'll have a lot of vernacular or handmade um, cemetery monuments of different sorts, um, hand carved or hand scrawled. Uh, sometimes they'll put marbles in them, things like that. But then also the very huge obelisks, there's a lot of folk art that goes into those, or at least art that is pertinent to that specific time period. And we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, you, one thing I also really like about cemeteries is they kind of give you an idea of what was available to folks. Um, a lot of these photos are from uh, old uh, Wakulla County which has tons of limestone. And you'll see a lot of limestone markers. Another thing you see a lot of in uh, cemeteries around here are old brick, which was locally made. Um, so it can kind of give you an idea of what types of materials were available for the people that were living there and what they considered to be a good type of material. Oops, hold on. There we go. So, Unfortunately, <laughs> not all burials are marked. And this is especially true in Florida. Our environment is really, really hard on um, historic cemetery markers, especially the wooden ones. Um, there are a couple that are left in some cemeteries. I know Chestnut Cemetery, Chestnut Street Cemetery in Apalachicola like, used to have some, but since the last couple of storm events, they're no longer there. So we get a lot of unmarked burials. And just like marked burials, unmarked burials are considered to be protected by law. And there are several different ways that you can go about identifying them. And I like to use a combination. When the first thing I usually like to do is use HRD dogs, human remain detection dogs. Um, there's a lady in Havana that I work with. She uh, volunteers her time and her dog's time. And she's actually a search and rescue volunteer with um, FBI. And that's how I learned about her. One of my friends is an FBI agent. 
And at first I didn't believe that these dogs could find, you know, remains that are a couple hundred years old in some cases. Well, Shiraz, her dog, it's a um, Belgian Malinois, has found human remains that are thousands of years old. So they do a really good job of narrowing down areas where we can use ground penetrating radar. Ground penetrating radar is what most people think of when they think of cemetery identifi identification, but the dogs are becoming a little more popular. But used in combination, it helps you narrow down the areas to use the ground penetrating radar because that's a lot of data to process. Everybody likes to think when you see it on CSI, there, you know, you'll see like a little skeleton in the screen. And, oh, that's where the burials are. It's not like that at all. You can't see the human remains. What you see is where the soil has been disturbed. So we don't know for sure that there's human remains there, but we look for patterns. In cemeteries, you expect to see, you know, people evenly, uh, human remains evenly spaced and, um, you know, a certain depth and a certain size. So once you start seeing those patterns, you can say, oh, that is indeed a cemetery. And that's kind of what we look for with ground penetrating radar, but it's not an exact science. So using that in conjunction with the dogs really does help us narrow down. Now, the only real way to know if there's human remains there is to excavate. And contrary to popular belief, um, archeologists do not like to excavate human remains if we can avoid it because they're sacred. Um, they're somebody's loved ones and that was supposed to be their final resting spot. So we try to avoid that if we possibly can. Unfortunately, there are threats to our cemeteries, especially here in Florida. Like I mentioned before, our environment is very harsh. So there's natural weathering. I was actually in Boston back in January, which seems so long ago now. <laughs> um, and a lot of their headstones, you know, it's a big city, have suffered greatly from uh, acid, rain, things of that nature, and some of them were illegible. And it was really interesting to see because a lot of the stones there are a lot older, sometimes even 100 or 200 years older than most of the stones we have here in Tallahassee. So it was kind of a foreshadowing of what I could expect to see, you know, in a couple hundred years, well not I, but other archaeologists could expect to see in a couple hundred years um, if our stones survive that long. So of course you have natural processes. Um, another big one we face in Florida is vandalism. Um, the photos I have up here are actually of Old City Cemetery. The last time it suffered some really, really horrible vandalism. Um, it's very expensive. These stones, they're historic and a lot of modern stone uh, workers don't have the expertise to be able to put these stones back together. So it takes a conservator and there's not that many here in the states that work with stones. There's a couple with the National Park Service and stuff like that, but it is fairly expensive and time consuming. So we try to educate folks on, you know, the reasons we want to preserve these. And besides that, it is illegal to vandalize cemeteries. Um, neglecting and abandon abandonment is also an issue here in Florida. We have a huge number of abandoned cemeteries. You get a lot of plantations and things like that. And as fam and you know, they bury their loved ones on the plantation. The plantation passes through many different hands. Families move away, and the cemetery is just kind of forgotten about because nobody's here to manage it. And a lot of people think it falls on the state to manage these cemeteries and it doesn't. It's, they really are kind of in this gray area where the landowners can maintain it, but they don't have to, the state doesn't have to. So, so we're just trying to do our best to kind of encourage folks. Um, but development, looting, one that I always like to touch on is improper cleaning methodology. Um, if you walk around a lot of cemeteries in our area, you'll see little chips at the bottom, at the base, about where the grass grows. And that's from weed eaters. I always discourage weed eater use, or if you do use a weed eater, put a guard on it so it doesn't hit the stone. It's stone and you think it's really, really hard, but these stones are actually a lot softer than you can imagine. And they don't last forever. Improper cleaning, one thing I stress is please do not use bleach. If you're going to use anything, there's a product called D2, the letter D, the number two. You can buy it online. A lot of um, home uh, improvement stores now carry it. 
but it's what the National Park Service recommends and it's what they use. And bleach, the reason we tell you not to use bleach is bleach contains salt. Um, stones contain iron. When you clean with bleach, it might look beautiful and white temporarily, but you come back a little while later, it's going to be orange, stained with iron um, rust. And that is irreversible. There's nothing we can do to change that. So please, whatever you do, do not use bleach. Use water. Just plain water and a soft bristle brush works wonders. So here's a couple other do's and don'ts. Um, when recording a cemetery, if you're going to put it on find a grave or something like that, um, I always encourage folks to uh, be as accurate as they can in their recording. If you don't know what something is, that's okay. Leave it blank. Um, photographs are great. Rubbings. I mean, I was guilty of this as a child too. <laughs> uh, I can remember doing rubbings. But over time, these, those rubbings do micro damage to the stone. And then that causes people to have to heart, rub harder and harder to get any image at all. And eventually it becomes illegible. Um, also fertilizer, herbicide, they can have salt and contain chemicals that can damage stones as well. What I use, and I use this in my yard too because I have dogs and I don't want them to get into the chemicals, grits. If you put grits, if you sprinkle grits on an ant pile, they uh, eat the grits and I guess it causes some, it reacts with their um, stomach acid and they die. Um, so you can do that. Another thing that I've done in the past, is a little bit more uh, technical, shall we say, <laughs> you have to work fast, is taking one anthill, shoveling it up and placing it on the, another anthill and they go to war and kill each other off. And that works pretty well as also. Um, <laughs> but Please do not use anything that contains salts or any types of chemicals. If you're ever unsure, I recommend don't use it. Um, there's other things you can use, but grits and war, <laughs> ant war, they work really well and they don't use any chemicals at all. When you're cleaning headstones, this is something anybody can do. You don't have to have any special training. My one word of advice is always to ask permission first, but, um, Soft bristle brush, D2, or just plain water works great. Don't use the wire bristle brushes. Um, they will scratch and um, damage the stone, but the cheap bristle brushes that you can get at like Walmart or uh, the dollar store, they work great. Another thing is um, you'll see things that to someone, you know, to somebody else's eye may not look very pretty or correct, um, culturally speaking, but different cultures have different burial practices. Um, during the um, CCC era and WPA era, one of the things they had, the government hired people to do was clean up historic cemeteries. Without knowing any better, they went around and they cleaned up broken glass and shells and old ceramics and things like that. But what they were really doing was taking grave goods and throwing them away. Different cultures have different practices. Within African American culture, it's very common to place glass on graves, shells. Sometimes they didn't have access to what we would typically consider a good grave marker. So they would use a child's toy or make a homemade cross out of pipe, things like that, that mark that grave. And without that stuff there, we wouldn't know where it is. And it also really, if you go to a historic cemetery, one of the things I like about them is they have a very unique character. A lot of our modern day cemeteries are construction, constructed with efficiency in mind. You know, everything is at ground level, so the mowers can rush right over it. The flower vases tip back into the ground. But historic cemeteries, were more personal people, you know, they didn't have as many rules. So you get a little bit more of a, you know, local flavor. And so if we start throwing away all of the things that give it that local flavor, then you're really left with nothing. So I always say, you know, leave it there. If you're managing a cemetery, I encourage every cemetery to have a management plan. And within that management plan, you can decide as a group, you know, how long are we going to allow the fake flowers out? How long are we going, or you know, what type of memorials are we going to allow? 
you know, can they have benches, things like that. But with historic cemeteries that have no management plan, you have to take this kind of stuff into account. It may not fit our modern ideals of beauty, but really that's what makes these cemeteries unique. Mowing, I really discourage riding lawnmowers. They do a lot of damage, they're hard to control. Can't tell you how many times I've seen um, ledgers, which are the things that lay flat on the ground, cracked and then mower wheel marks on them. And, you know, they rode right over it and cracked and fell in a little bit. Um, no herbicides, trim branches. After Hurricane Andrew, or Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Michael, for months I went and visited historic cemeteries that they hadn't maintained their trees. And tree damage was extensive. I'm talking root uprooted, uh, graves exposed, uh, broken monuments because of limbs that fell onto them. Get a certified arborist out there. If you have to take a tree out, you have to take a tree out. That's, it just happens. Trees don't live forever. Um, you can replace it, that's okay. And when you do try and replace it, there's different trees that are better suited to storm environments and um, live oaks are great, things like that. Uh, pine trees, not so great. <laughs> I mean, we know living in Florida what trees are good and what trees are bad, but I definitely recommend getting an arborist out to cemeteries occasionally. And this is true for our homes as well. Um, I know after Hurricane Michael, I sure got an arborist out at my house. <laughs> So it's something to think about during hurricane season. And I always encourage cemeteries to have a plan for hurricane preparations. And that includes your trees and um, other plantings as well. So historic gravestones are essentially historic documents. They're just written in stone instead of on paper. And you can learn a lot about the people that were buried there and the people that buried them by looking at what the um, great with the different ledgers and headstones say. You, different symbols mean different things. If you look at them collectively, you can kind of get an idea for how old a cemetery is. You can get an idea of different patterns, you know, religion. Are there, you know, people buried in family plots? Are they buried based on their religion? Um, and you, sometimes you end up with more questions than answers, but that's what makes cemeteries fun. Um, but when I, you go to a cemetery, I always encourage people to just kind of walk around um, and take in the whole entire cemetery, uh, but look at specific stones. Are there a lot of children? Um, you know, what does that say about that time period? Um, are there a lot of handmade stones? What does that say about the socioeconomic class of the people that um, were buried there? Um, this is one of my favorite headstones. I just, I love the heart and I love, what's really common is to see S's and sometimes other letters backwards. Um, and I think it just gives it a little bit of character. An epitaph is really just a short little bit of text that honors a deceased person. And early on, you see very um, kind of standardized um, epitaphs, like sleep here, sleep, sleeps here is my dear mother, or God called me home, things that, you know, are pretty kind of generic. Uh, but you also get some really cool ones. And even up into the modern times, we're getting really creative. And as our stone carving um, technology improves, you're starting to see some really fun ones. But one of my favorite ones is in um, the Keys. It's in the cemetery in Key West. And it's Mr. B.P. Roberts. He died in 1979, so it's not too old. But his epitaph is, I told you I was sick. <laughs> I just think that's just, I mean, he obviously had a good sense of humor and it just kind of gives you a little bit insight into his personality and possibly why he died, right? Um, this other one I have is a modern one, but think about how fun it'll be to future archeologists to kind of wander through a cemetery and see this. And I actually keep meaning to make this recipe, but you can imagine, you know, you ask your mom for her cookie recipe and she says, over my dead body. Well, there it is, <laughs> over her dead body. Um, so, you know, we're just, 
they add character, these epitaphs, and I really like more of the modern ones just because they are a little bit more different. But the historic ones also speak to that time period um, during the Victorian period, they get a bit much longer and more elaborate, and more mournful because during that time period, death was around them everywhere and it became fashionable almost to mourn. And that was due to Queen Victoria and her mourning rituals. So speaking of that, um, we're gonna kind of get into a little bit about death and burial practices. Um, and like I just said, during the Victorian period, late 18th century, um, going into you know, the middle, or excuse me, the early and middle 18th century, um, you have a lot of doom and gloom. That's when you get these death heads, which you know, they're the skulls with the little angel wings and things like that. And I saw a ton of that up in Boston and it's gorgeous. And one other thing is um, in the Northeast, they use a lot of slate, which we don't really see down here. It just doesn't last in our environment. But um, as we kind of roll out of that doom and gloom Victorian period, and you have to remember during that period we're uh, here in the States, we're going through the Civil War. So yeah, between that and um, a lot of disease, death was all around us. Uh, women were lucky to survive childbirth. A child was lucky to live, live to the age of five. Um, it was a harsh, harsh reality. Um, but stemming from that, you had urban growth. We had a bunch of people. You had the industrialization of our nation. Um, you, and you had a lot of people moving to these urban centers because there were more resources, um, less farmers, more people working in the big cities. But with that, you don't have as much green space. So around this time, cemeteries start to become more park-like. And you have this movement where you have more landscape features and, you know, statues and this one is of uh, the one in Savannah which I'm sure a lot of you have been to but they kind of become more romanticized they kind of became more public displays they were more um, they were set in the city center rather than in the periphery and um, you know they would People would stroll through these cemeteries. They would have picnics at these cemeteries. This is when the tabletop tombs become popular. And the reason for that is people would come and they would have picnics in the cemeteries. And during that picnic time, that's when they would go and kind of maintain their family members' graves, their family plot, and things like that. So it was like a potluck family work day at the cemetery. So it was a little different. <laughs> um, we had also a lot of uh, big, large rural cemeteries um, on the outskirts of town because when you have these big urban centers, you start to run out of room in the smaller urban cemeteries. And so that kind of garden movement kind of starts to branch out into the rural area as well. And if any of you have been to Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And what's neat is even today, Oakland Cemetery still has a lot of events that you wouldn't necessarily associate with cemeteries. People used to get buried, or um, get buried, obviously, get married in these cemeteries. Now in Oakland Cemetery, you can still have your wedding and people still do at Oakland Cemetery. It's absolutely stunning. So they start to become a multi-use space. And I really, I would like to see us get back to that. Um, I've been going to a lot of cemeteries just because I know I won't run into a lot of people. They're great places to social distance. <laughs> but um, in Europe, they actually use a lot of their cemeteries as um, birding and wildlife areas. They actually don't mow their cemeteries as often. They allow the wildflowers and the grasses to grow and it produces a lot of wildlife, a lot of birds, and you'll actually see people out there with their binoculars birding pretty regularly. So Queen Victoria, as I mentioned, 
uh, mourned like a champ. <laughs> Very fashionable, of course. Um, she popularized a lot of mourning rituals and Victorian mourning artifacts and outfits start to become really elaborate. You have hair jewelry, which wasn't always a mourning ritual. Uh, sometimes you would have hair jewelry made out of your children's hair, things like that. But a lot of people would wear hair jewelry made from the hair of their loved ones. And um, I was doing research on this and I found one woman in the United States who still makes hair jewelry. You can actually save your hair and ship it off to her and she'll make a piece of hair jewelry for you. You had um, death masks, um, which essentially it was a mask made of the deceased so that way people could always have an image of their face this is also the time i don't have a photo of it because um, it can be a little off-putting to some but um memento mori photography death photography um this started to happen around the time that photography became widely available but not many people would think to take photographs family portraits and things like that or they would have a child pass away before they had a chance to take their child's photograph. So they would actually take photographs of the deceased. Sometimes they would even paint on the photograph little rosy cheeks or um, their eyes would usually be closed. They would paint their eyes on them to make them look, look more alive. And sometimes there's even a family portrait. So you'd have all the kids sitting on the couch next to their deceased sibling. And it sounds very, very like, kind of morbid to us, but to them it was the only photograph they would ever have of their loved one. So um, it was something that a lot of people did and it was widely available. You also had jet jewelry. Um, black jewelry was very popular for women and there were different stages of mourning. So depending, you know, there's full mourning, quarter mourning, half mourning, and there was a whole ritual surrounding it. Now, one of my favorite things to do in a cemetery is I kind of like the hunt <laughs> of looking for different symbols. I have several that are my favorite. The willow tree. Um, one of my favorite, though, is the um, flower bud, the life yet to bloom. If you're familiar with the um, language of flowers, different flowers mean different things. So you can go through a cemetery and find a lily, which means purity, and you can think to yourself, well, this person, maybe it was a young woman, you know. Um, you also had an anchor, you know, you can imagine, like, of course, you might think, oh, he was obviously maybe a mariner, but it could also symbolize the anchor of the family, the head of household, um, rocks, stability or strength. Um, you'll see a lot of lambs on children's graves. One of my favorite though is a life cut short. And if you're walking around the cemetery and there are some at Old City Cemetery, you'll see a flower and it'll look like it's broken. The stem is broken. And that symbolizes a life cut short. But here's just a few examples for you. Um, you have Jesse here who has some buds. This was actually a child's grave and then an anchor. And that grave right there is actually a Woodman of the World marker. Uh, it was a fraternal organization that used to offer, I think up until 1949, they offered a headstone with a uh, purchase of their life insurance policy. They don't do that anymore. It got a little pricey, but here you can see a really, really good symbolism of the anchor and the Woodsmen of the World are just really neat because they always had some type of tree trunk or stacked wood. They're all very, they were all carved um, unique to that individual's wishes, but they all have certain characteristics that make it obvious that they're part of the woodsman. And a lot of times they'll have the wood, woodsman emblem. And it's still an organization today. Um, it just doesn't offer the headstones anymore. Um, here you have some of those death heads that were really popular uh, during the Victorian era. We don't really see many of them here. I think most of our cemeteries are a little bit too late for that um, era in the Victorian period, but you have a lamb, uh, cherubs and angels are very popular, especially among children's graves. So as you're walking through a cemetery, you can kind of start to see uh, the makeup of it, how many adults there are. There are a lot of children and things like that. And, um, you know, 
what religion they were, it's not uncommon to see Mason or, you know, military emblems or with men of the world. So you can start to kind of identify and see who made up that community and give you some kind of idea, historically speaking, who was living in that area. And here I already talked a little bit about woodsmen of the world, but here's just some more examples uh, of what they looked like. And as you can see, they're unique, but they all obviously have some identifying characteristics. Mainly, they're either a wood column or sometimes stacked wooden uh, logs. So we offer a workshop called Cemetery Resource Protection Training, and it goes over a lot of what we went over today. Um, but it also gives you a, a chance to go out and put that knowledge to use. Obviously right now we can't really offer it with social distancing, but we are hoping to in the future. And um, if, you know, if anything, we're, we're trying to develop some of our programming um, virtually and remotely, but you can't go out and clean a cemetery remotely. But I want to emphasize that cemeteries are a great place to get outdoors and social distance. There's usually not a lot of people out there. Um, you can go out and kind of look around, see if you see any symbols that we've talked about today. Um, so I encourage you all to do that. Um, they're one of the few spaces that are usually left open. A lot of our park trails are kind of becoming inundated with people. But with that, does anybody have any questions for me? Sorry, you missed it. I'm sorry. And if, um, if you do, just uh, unmute yourself before you speak so I can. I have a question. Yes. Um, my question is, is there a, a, a booklet or a book that would be, in effect, a, a tour guide to interesting cemeteries in Florida? For example, I recently went, uh, well, actually, this is in Georgia. I went to Bainbridge looking for Miriam Hopkins, big oh. cemetery, never found her. Is there a guide to such places? There's, um, there's not really one guide, unfortunately. Um, what I always recommend people do is go on um, Find a Grave. And I will say with Find a Grave, it's a great resource. And I encourage people to always record what they find on Find a Grave. But the Florida Master Site file is a statewide database of all historic and um, archaeological sites in Florida, and that includes cemeteries. When you record a site with the site file, that is what protects it. That's where, you know, when somebody needs a permit to develop, that's where they go to check to see if there's anything around them that they should, you know, protect or take into consideration. So I always encourage folks to also fill out a Florida master site file form. Anybody can do it. You can find it on the Florida Division of Historical Resources website, or you can shoot me an email and I'll do it. Um, but there really is no one source. Um, the F Florida um, Department of State has developed some uh, resources, their booklets that you can download and they're different time periods are kind of historic trails and they're divided by region and those will have some cemeteries listed in them but they're specific to that theme there's one for Spanish Florida there's one for um, Native American Florida there's one for British Florida so after there's an African American trail there's even a golf trail <laughs> if any of you are golfers but you can, um, mm -hmm. so if there's like a specific time period you're interested in and you want to visit cemeteries of that time period, those are a good resource. Um, I always recommend if something, if you're really interested in historical cemeteries, to reach out to the local historical society. They're the ones that will know the cemeteries in that area upside down and inside out. Um, so they're always a good resource. Most of them have websites. Some of them even have museums and you can stop in and check, you know, talk with them. But definitely check with local historical societies. And that's true, not just for Florida, but anywhere you visit. Um, I have a question. Um, okay. I um, volunteer to take photos for Find a Grave. Uh -huh. and, um, so, Oakland Cemetery is pretty easy because it's all um, the, the cemeteries mapped online. But Old 
cemetery. Um, is there any kind of map? I know the one quadrant was done by an Eagle Scout on the back of the sign, but um, I had a request and I like, walked all over the cemetery and couldn't find it. Um, I do have a friend that, is this the local Oakland Cemetery? Yeah, um, I, I, I can do Oakland City Cemetery because that's online on Tallahassee government. But the Old City Cemetery, um, have you been to the Old City Cemetery? I love the Old City Cemetery. <laughs> well, that, that sign um, on the back of it, it, an Eagle Scout did one quadrant of the cemetery. But um, I've had requests on other parts of the cemetery, and it's a lot of walking to find, you know, I can't find a, a grave. Um, if, if it was mapped. If you want to, you can, um, I, I work closely with some of the folks at the city. The city is actually, I, I don't know what the status is now with the um, pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, uh, one of their employees was working on uh, mapping the entire cemetery accurately. Um, and we also had an arborist come out there and evaluate the trees and um, I don't know what the status is on that project, but if you wanted to shoot me an email, I can put you in touch with him. He may know, um, you know, where the markers you're looking for are located. Um, but my email is Barbara A. Clark um, at uwf.edu. And here I will. Um, I usually have it up on here, but I don't. But it's there you go. If you can see that, it's Barbara A. Clark at uwf.edu, and I can get you in touch with folks at the city that can help you with that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yes, I had a question about the. Um the Doja School for Boys, what exactly is the status of that right now? Have you been, at least on the periphery, been involved with that? Um, we haven't been involved in that at all. I know um, fairly recently there was, um, they thought they had potentially some more burials. Those were investigated and they were found not to be burials. Um, and I know there's been a couple uh, books written about it, I believe. Um, we were asked not to be involved <laughs> with that just because it became uh, quite a quagmire. But um, I believe most recently, and this was a couple months ago, there were some suspected burials. And when they investigated, they realized that they were indeed not burials. That's my understanding. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Figured things were still up in the air there. Um, I also had another thing. When you were talking about uh, the remains being left there, they're always, in, at least ideally, they would be left in the ground. Um, would family ever go back and want to exhume them to bury them again? Has that ever happened? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And there is a process for that. Uh, it involves both, or depending on the age of the burial in the state of Florida, anything 75 years old or older as far as human remains goes is considered archaeological. Anything early or later than that is um, the domain of the um, of law enforcement, essentially, or the, um, the morgue. Um, so when somebody wants to reinter a family member in a different cemetery, the first thing they have to do is contact their local health department of where that cemetery is located and they can help with that process. But there's a whole process set up for that. That happens fairly regularly. Um, it's just we have, to, you know, it has to be done correctly and there's permits and things like that involved. And um, if it's a Native American grave, there's a whole nother process that um, gets the federal government involved because um, there's certain protections put in place for Native American graves as well.
Any other questions? All right, well, um, thank you so much for um, hanging out with me virtually today. And like I said, I hope you all are safe and well. Um, if you would love to, if you would like to go out to a cemetery, I encourage you to do so. Just, you know, keep your social distance and all that stuff. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, if anybody has any questions that come up, you know, later on tonight or anytime, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat just one more time. Oh, somebody, um, said in the chat, epitaphs, I found one that said, this man loved his mule. <laughs> That's unique. So I'm putting my email in the chat um, right now. Now, if you are interested in a workshop, I can definitely set that up for you. Uh, we won't really be able, right now I'm under travel restrictions. So I am working from home for the foreseeable future. Um, but hopefully soon we'll be able to do some workshops and things. At the very least, we can do a Zoom workshop. If there's some folks that are interested in that, we can try and alter our in-person workshops to try them over Zoom. Uh, we just wouldn't be able to actually go out to the cemetery and do the work, but we can maybe do, make a video and show it to you or something like that. Um, but if you're interested, we're definitely willing to work for you. And that goes for anything. Um, we have a lot of resources on our website, which I'll also put in the chat. And uh, if any of you are helping with homeschooling, we have lesson plans and all sorts of fun things. But if you have any questions that come up to your mind after this, you can email me. I check my email numerous times a day and I'm happy to help you all out. Um, with that being said, anything else? Okay. Oh, thank you for the information. Yeah. and. Um, Y'all stay safe and well, and hopefully one day we can all meet in person. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And I'm going to end the meeting now, so I'll see you all later. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Uh -huh. Excellent. Ex uh, fascinating. Thank you. <laughs>